Hi, OCD family community. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Any guesses? The answer is actually none. Because, you see, the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> I heard that joke ages ago, and I don't even know where I heard it from. So if you know, fam, please feel free to let me know so I can share the love. But it's adjacent to today's conversation, because we're talking with our special guest expert, Dr. Alec Pollard, PhD, as we talk all about what we can do when a loved one won't seek mental health treatment. So settle in, fam, because we've got lots of important family business to discuss. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family. The OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. All righty. Well, welcome back to the show, fam. It's great to be in season three, which holy moly, how are we three seasons in already? It's amazing. And we have so many fantastic folks coming to hang out and share help, hope, and support with the OCD family community. And today is no exception. But I have to say, family, this has been a crazy week. First of all, it was a holiday week here in the U.S. where we celebrated Labor Day. And then we also had field trips this week. We had new practices. We even had a dentist appointment, which ironically, we're going to learn is not one of our special guest's favorite pastimes. But I have to tell you this story, fam. So I mentioned field trips, right? So I went on a field trip with my son's class. And the name and the theme of the field trip was Survive Alive. And as the name would suggest, it was a bit anxiety-provoking, perhaps why they asked the therapist's mother to attend. So essentially, around the United States are these different survive alive houses. I kind of looked into it because I was like, I'm curious. Are we the only ones that do this? No. But there are these things called survive alive houses, and they are built to teach grade schoolers about fire safety. Because if you want to survive alive, you have to plan for it. Now, I really appreciate the need to both plan and practice our value-driven goals like surviving alive, if you will. But this field trip was intense. One of the first things they did was they took us on a tour of household items retrieved by the fire department from real house fires. Like anything from a toothbrush to a care bear, half melted, charred, disintegrated. And I get that this field trip was targeted toward the children understanding the importance and the realities of emergencies. So having a PS5 game controller and pictures that are melted really did create that immersive experience. But it was also somewhat terrifying. And then we practice safety skills on how to react and assess quickly what is the safest exit, for example. After which, then the children practice escaping out of a second story window, going to a safe meeting place, and then calling in a simulated dispatcher who really took their 911 call. They had to call 911, and the dispatcher would be like, what's your emergency? And they went through the whole thing. It was all very thorough. Then we watched a video on the four top ways that you can die in a fire. And it was like this 90s version of a Dateline type special, and it felt pretty intense to me. So I can only imagine for the kiddos who were like, ugh, what they were thinking and feeling. And then we did our last simulated drill where we escaped from a house fire. And they used special effects to light a wall on fire. They had what was a fog machine, but it looked like smoke. They had us crawling through these dark hallways you couldn't see because apparently it gets real dark when there's real bad fire. And so you had to know how to navigate around. They had heated coils in the walls, in the, in the doors to emanate heat. So you needed to assess, oh my gosh, it's too hot this way. It might not be safe. And you had to quickly react because time, time is a big factor when you're in a fire. I mean, it was intense. I am a therapist that practices exposure and response prevention, and I'm telling you, it was intense. So it's been a busy week, a full week, dare I say a dramatic week, but the nerd in me family that loves a good analogy thought about how this reminded me of the conversation that we're going to have today. 
because today we're talking about when our loved ones are suffering from debilitating conditions. For many of us, that's going to be our OCD warriors. For some, it may be our OC-related or OCRD warriors. And as we'll chat about with Alec very soon here, it could be anything else in between. But we're talking about when they're suffering. Their lives may feel like it's on fire. You see what I did there? But they can't, for perhaps a range of reasons, or won't, seek treatment. So y'all may not be in a survive alive house, but you are trying to survive. And if that's you, you're in the right place. Because we have one of the top experts on the subject here to not only talk with us about this very important subject, but also to share about a new book he's written that can lay out a plan, y'all. Yes, a plan on how not only you and your family can survive this, but thrive. So before we dive into all that goodness, let me first tell you about Alec. He is the founding director of the Center for OCD and Anxiety-Related Disorders at St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute, as well as Professor Emeritus at St. Louis University School of Medicine. He has authored over 100 publications, including his new book, When a Loved One Won't Seek Mental Health Treatment. But wait, there's more. Fam, Alec happened to be this year's Outstanding Career Achievement Award winner at the 29th Annual OCD Conference in Orlando, and it's simple to understand why. Among other things, he has an avid focus on reaching people who have not benefited from evidence-based care. And ultimately, that's what led him and his team to writing this newest book, which is pretty hot off the press, I have to say, because it just started hitting shelves in May of this year. So when I heard Alex speak at this year's conference, I beelined to greet him and invite him to hang out with the fam. And he was eager to accept, as this community is so near and dear to his heart. So it's a real pleasure to have Alec join us today. Now, when we typically think of recovery avoiders, as you'll soon learn more about in today's chat, we can find this phenomenon in most age ranges. But there is a majority of folks listening that are going to have adult children, elder parents, partners, or adult siblings struggling with this dynamic. And this isn't to say minors can't show up in this conversation. So while we will be focusing on the adult dynamics, if you have a teen or a kiddo even where you're feeling stuck, you are still welcome to this conversation and these tips can still apply. Additionally, family, when distress is high, perhaps because your loved one's mental health has created so much distressing noise or your life has changed so dramatically to oversee the care of your loved one, we recognize that an array of challenges and crises can arise. So while I will provide a general trigger warning that we will describe some scenarios that may elevate distress or discomfort within family dynamics. We are also going to talk in greater detail about suicidal concerns or fears that someone might try to kill themselves. And I know this is a very hard topic for a lot of people to discuss. Much like imagining the four top ways me or my children could die in a fire was tough. But because this is a very realistic concern that comes up in many families, or fear of violence, rage, and what that could do, we do have some candid discussions about what we can do in those situations. And while we will be brainstorming and discussing this topic, please remember, as I said in the introduction, that this information does not substitute as treatment. So if you or your loved one has experienced suicidal thoughts or violent outbursts, or you're actively concerned for your safety or theirs, connect them with a medical professional or even consult with your country's emergency medical number for immediate help. But if you can hang with us for this conversation, fam, I hope you do. Because as triggering as these conversations can be, developing a plan, learning what is or isn't within our control, and knowing there's hope can make a substantial difference. So without further ado, let's get to chatting with Alec. Well, welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. Today, we have just an absolute treasure in our field. I'm going to brag on you, Dr. Alec Pollard. He is here with us today, and he has contributed so much to the OCD research community, to the teaching community. I believe he's on the BTTI faculty, which is the Behavioral Therapy Training Institute, sponsored through the International OCD Foundation to help train future generations of clinicians. So, well, Welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you here. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. You're picking a topic here that is one of my favorites. Yes. And this is part of why we're meeting today is you recently wrote a new book called When a Loved One Won't Seek Mental Health Treatment. But also, I will just say you have been a voice on this topic 
for quite some time. So family, if you've ever been to the International OCD Foundation Conference, or if you've been to ADAA, which is the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, Alec has talked about this content quite a bit. And I'm going to predict, not a mind reader, but I'm going to predict we'll have quite a few people tuning in because we're going to talk about when a loved one is like, nope, I can't. I'm not going to go into treatment. I don't think I need treatment. There can be a number of facets to this, and we'll get into all of that and more. But before we dive in, I'm just curious, Alec, have you always treated in the specialty of OCD or what brought you into this area of psychology and the therapy world? Well, since I was a legal professional, meaning I had a license, I've always been interested in OCD and anything involving anxiety. And uh, that was the case in graduate school. I I studied chronic pain, the the psychological aspects of chronic pain in graduate school, decided, did my dissertation on it, decided I didn't like it. And I said, what have I done? Oh, Uh, no. Take myself into the wrong career here. And then I thought about what do I really enjoy working with? And I remembered the relatively few anxious and OCD inspired people, Mm -hmm. I call it, and I enjoyed working with them. So I thought, where can I go get the best training in that? And I was looking for a postdoctoral fellowship and I was very fortunate. I got one at the behavior therapy unit at Temple University, which was a hotbed Mm -hmm. for OCD and anxiety research. And they were, my mentors were people like Edna Foa, Mm -hmm. John Grayson, Charlie Mansueto. They were all there. Gail Steckety were all at the same location. It was really an amazing experience. Wow. Yes. And all of them were relatively junior at the time. The big cheese there was Joseph Wolpe, the father of behavior therapy. He was the director of the unit. So it was tremendous experience. And that was it. I mean, as soon as I was there for a day, I was all right. That was it. You were sold. (laughs) I was it and loved the work and spent a year there and then came to St. Louis and was asked to, was hired by the medical center to start a center there, Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. And that's what I did. And I've been in St. Louis ever since. That's amazing. So it's interesting because you you mentioned some huge giants in the field and many people tuning in are going to say, and you're right up there too, Alec, you are a giant in our field. In fact, if you were at the conference this year, you know that he received the Outstanding Career Achievement Award from the International OCD Foundation and has really contributed a lot to our understanding of how this disorder functions. Function is such a huge piece of understanding and treating OCD. And today we're going to be talking about the function of even being in that space where we're ready for treatment or not ready for treatment. But I really love the conversation that you create around this, both in the book and just in the talks and advocacy you've done around this topic, because there are a number of different reasons that someone may benefit from a treatment. And there's a number of reasons someone may hesitate, and I use that word intentionally, to engage in treatment, not because they want to suffer, but there are multifaceted pieces here, both, I would say, for the direct sufferer and And really within the family system, we can have some real challenges. So we're going to be covering all of that and more today. And so you wrote this book. And how did this area of study become a real focus for you? And you've you've worked with a team, we should mention, Dr. Melanie Van Dyke. And I believe, let's see, is it Heidi Pollard? Yeah, Heidi, just a coincidence, she had the same last name. No, and uh, Gary Mitchell, who is a senior clinician in our staff. And then Glory Mathis was a postdoc with us many years ago. And then she, long distance, has been co-authoring this with us. Um, yeah. So great team. And it was the same team, minus Gloria. She kind of came in later, but it was the same team that started musing about this issue in the early 90s, like, we need to do something, this isn't right, blah, blah, blah. And and that's, it sort of was an organic process of a, yeah. a lot of conversations and staff meetings, complaining. Yeah. Uh, and that's how many of my great ideas come out, uh, starting with complaining. And we were complaining about, well, our guilt, because we were telling people, like most people do now, well, if your loved one doesn't want help, there's nothing we can do. Sorry. See yeah. you later. 
We didn't say see you later that way. Right. You couched it a little differently, but that's you that's the diplomat. bullet point. <laughs> but I think that's how families experienced it. Like, oh, okay, fine. Just let us deal with it. We're miserable here. And so we started realizing that there probably are some things that we can do. And and one person that I really one of many that I admire that influenced my thinking was a guy by the name of Paul Vatslavic. And mm -hmm. he was what was called the Palo Alto group in the 60s. And he he was a family systems theorist and mm -hmm. cybernetics and had all these different things that he was into. And he he said that you should always treat the person who's motivated. Yeah. And that stuck with me. And we started thinking about these families are motivated themselves. They are motivated. They're suffering. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? Aren't these the people we're supposed to help? And so we started working with families and saying, maybe there's some things we can do to help you all deal with this very difficult situation. Yeah. We're not miracles. We can't make someone want to change or, uh, and, and honestly, I don't, uh, that's really probably an oversimplification to say want to change. Right. It's recovery avoiders, and we could talk about what that means. Yeah. But a recovery avoider doesn't. It's not that they don't want to change. Nobody loves being disabled and impaired. Right. And they really don't have a clue how to get out of it. And their behavior is driven by, you know, known behavioral factors that we right. all with with our, our other patients every day. But we don't think about applying it to the problem of recovery. Right. Um, think of it as, oh, let's let's use these principles to treat OCD or depression, whatever. Right. And that's a parallel interest of mine is the people who are recovery avoidant, who will come in, mm -hmm. talk to you. Mm -hmm. We also try to help them deal right. with their recovery. Avoidance. The hardcore refusers, what we, we used to call treatment refusers. We later came up with the concept of recovery avoidance as a, a, a wider umbrella to cover people who refuse treatment altogether, deny there's a problem, acknowledge a problem, but refuse to acknowledge it's psychiatric. Yeah. It's psychiatric, but think they can handle it on their own. Admit it's psychiatric and we'll go get help, but they're constantly getting the wrong kind of help. You yeah. know, the five years of primal scream therapy has not worked that well for most of my OCD patients. Right. Um, my apologies to anyone who's an ardent primal screen. <laughs> We've just lost all the primal screamers. We've lost the primal scream people. I'm sorry. And the final group is really the people who go to treatment, but just never seem to be able to benefit from it. And mostly because they have trouble engaging in it the way you need to engage in therapy to maximize your benefits. And again, that's not they're intending to do that. They themselves are under influences of forces that drive recovery avoidance. And, yeah. and want to say, and I think people have gotten the impression by now, recovery avoidance is just a, a pattern of behavior that's in the opposite direction of what you need to do to, to get better. And we call it that based on the outcome of the behavior, not the intention of the behavior. So yeah. The result is recovery avoidance, but certainly not the intention of the person who's avoiding. Yeah. I was going to say, when you were clarifying the oversimplification of saying want, and this is something that you've addressed in the book and in a lot of your talks, so you talk about some of the myths on why people may struggle to get into treatment or connect in treatment. And as you said, sometimes they can be in treatment and it's just a matter of like, gosh, we're kind of hitting these walls. What's going on? And so this is what the broader conversation's about. And you may listen to this family and you may go, well, I think this is true even outside of OCD. And yes, absolutely. You know, recovery oh. avoidance is common. And that's something that you talk and speak about as well. I mean, we can see this show up. Alec and I were talking before we started recording. I was saying in my observations, a lot of similarities actually I see in the substance use community and with substance use disorder and OCD. But we can see it, you know, even you said originally when studying chronic illness, I'm sure you saw it in that population. And so it's interesting because when we're looking at some of our evidence-based practices, we're looking at it's really a science and a good thing because then we can see if it's working and we can reproduce that and get those results. 
But we're zooming out and we're even looking at kind of what's going on around. What are these dynamics that we're finding isn't just happening in OCD. It's happening in these other areas. And someone is struggling with facing an obstacle. When you talked about the difference between the motivation and another thing that I thought about, and again, family, you're going to be like, yes, yes, we get it. It connects to substances for you. But one of the treatment protocols that's so successful and is talked a little bit about in the OCD community, too, is motivational interviewing. And why does that help, right? And so in terms of talking about motivations, can we talk about maybe some of the similarities and differences when we talk about motivations of why the family wants your loved one to please get this help? And what is the motivation? Because there's still, even if you're seeing some reluctance or avoidance, it's not that a person is lacking motivation. Almost always somebody wants to feel better. They don't want to live in this hell. So yeah, yeah, let's, can we talk about that? Sure. So motivation, what we call motivation deficits, we identify four reasons why people avoid recovery and actors that drive them. And we're not saying that there can't be any others. There are others that are sometimes just pragmatic issues. Yeah. Even simple issue. If you live in a farm and you've got one car for 10 people in the family and just getting to a session, if you don't have Wi-Fi, for example, and at least in the old days, that was, was a very difficult task and it had nothing to do with any of the things we're talking about. But yeah. so we certainly understand that recovery avoidance is ubiquitous. All of us have a little bit of it. My dentist, I'm going to admit this, <laughs> on the air, considers me a recovery avoider. And so, all right, there, I've said it. <laughs> and, you know, we have to be open about our own issues. Yeah. So, yeah, recovery avoidance is something we all do a little bit of here and there when we're not behaving in ways consistent with health and are overcoming a problem. And so we really want to try to promote an attitude of non judgmentalness and really more understanding. Now, you can understand a problem and still protect yourself from it. Yep. We'll get in a little bit how important that is for families to do. But you asked me specifically about motivation, and motivation is one of the issues, motivational deficits. And when we talk about motivation, distinguishing that from what we call incentive deficits, which are incentives are the more immediate contingencies of life that affect our behavior, whereas motivation we talk about as being the desire that's driven by long-term goals to go to college, to have a relationship. And so when we're talking about motivational interviewing, we're talking about really helping patients clarify what their motivations are, what their long-term goals, what they want out of life, what their values are. Yeah. And so though that's very important. And then you have incentive deficits that are really about those daily distractions and things that get in your way and reinforce bad behavior or good behavior, the more immediate contingencies. Then you have skill deficits that that people, certain skills people do not have. Organizational skills. Executive functioning, different neurodivergent processing can can cause different struggles, right? You know, just think about in in our culture right now, how hard it is just to make an appointment with a provider. Mm -hmm. Don't have one, for example. First, you got to go find, well, who are the providers? What specialty do I need? You might have to do a little bit of research. You don't have to, but you're smart to do it. And then you've got to have the gumption to keep calling because many providers are not taking new patients. And I'm not just talking about mental health. I'm just talking about right. primary care docs, whatever. Right. And then you have the organizational skills and the comfort on the phone to talk or to get on the internet and make an appointment and then follow through or have a schedule so that you know when to show up for the appointment. Oh, God forbid, you have to do paperwork. And if that's an issue. So all I'm saying is just the simple act of making an appointment requires certain fundamental skills that not every person has. Mm -hmm. And there are other kinds of skill deficits that can promote recovery avoidance. And then finally, there are belief systems that people have that uh, strongly influence their tendency to seek help in one or more areas of their life or not. And uh, if I, for example, if I have this belief that the medical community is out to get me or that all medicines are poison, uh, 
they're not likely to seek help from a, a medical practitioner, for example. So there are all these different reasons and, and none of them are going to change because of what families normally do, which we can talk about more of right. in response to recovery avoidance. So the, all of that is really important for all of us as family members or therapists or friends of people who have lived experience with OCD. It's just important to keep that in mind because it's easy to start to attribute things like they're lazy, mm -hmm. they're willful, they're, they're obstinate, and start labeling them with negative labels that really don't explain their behavior. They just seek to sort of give some sort of sense of explanation for their behavior. But the problem is that when we label our loved ones with those types of negative labels, we're justifying in our mind our continued engagement in what we call minimizing behavior, which we'll get into, but in types of behaviors that are actually not helpful and worse can make things worse. So, yeah. So we want the best and healthiest way is to try to understand that that individuals with OCD or any disorder, our book is not just about OCD, it's about any mental illness mm -hmm. that uh, impairs an individual and affects the family. So although most of our early experience came from working with OCD patients. And yeah, sometimes I'll use this analogy. It's kind of like, and I'm, I'm older, so my <laughs> reference for social media is Facebook. Judge as you must. But, you know, how many times have you gone in our very polarized times and gone on to Facebook and, and convinced somebody of an argument that can be somewhat triggering and people can feel a lot of emotional investment in by minimizing techniques, by name calling, right? You know, how many people are like, you know, I thought about this one way, but then I read this comment on Facebook and now it's just completely changed my mind. No, people dig in their heels more. They're like, you're the problem. And how far does that get us? But it kind of even goes back to the importance, and this is a heavy emphasis, not only in the book, but something we talk about in this community a lot, is being able to talk to each other and actually hear each other. When you said some of my musings and a lot of my work has developed out of having these conversations at staff meetings, I was like thinking the key part there to me is that you communicated. Whether y'all agreed or didn't agree or were feeling frustrated or not, like we were speaking into existence, here is the problem, right? And we're having some communication around that. And ultimately, that's really what we need to be able to do is have these conversations. It can be hard because everybody's like acting out a great intention. Often they're like, I love my person so much. I want to help them so much. And as I've said many times here before, thank you for loving your person. Thank you. We can't do this without you. And they can't do this without you. Like that support means a lot. But also how we show that support and some strategic posture shifts in what we do, because that's ultimately all we can control is what we do, can have this ripple effect and impact. Before we dive fully into that, though, can I ask one other clarifying question? When we're talking about motivation and incentive deficits and challenges, can you differentiate for anybody listening what might be the difference between when we're talking about motivation versus insight? Because a lot of times our folks that are struggling, and again, not just with OCD, may have varying levels of insight, and that's not the same thing as motivation. But I think sometimes they can get conflated if somebody's not able to kind of have a more global understanding of what's going on for them. They can easily get pinned or minimized as somebody that's not motivated. And it's not that simplified either. So can you help people listening that might have that question understand the difference? Yeah. So let's take a guy by the name of Roy. And Roy has OCD and Roy is a recovery avoider. Mm -hmm. So the difference is why Roy might not want to go get help. Mm -hmm. So if it's a motivational issue, then it means probably that Roy either has insufficient long-term goals mm -hmm. or he has goals, but he doesn't see his condition as interfering with those goals. Mm -hmm. So one or both of those. So you'll, you'll have folks who really don't have much in terms of long-term goals, or sometimes they have goals, but they really don't see how impossible that goal will be to fulfill if they don't get over their condition. And those would be what we call motivational deficits. Now, what I think most people are talking about when they talk about insight would 
be more for me in the category of beliefs mm -hmm. that whenever people have any kind of condition, it is a human tendency to try to make sense of it within the best of our knowledge and our intellectual capability. So we try to make some sense of it. And so people that I think are usually labeled as having poor insight are people who have made, if the problem is insight related, it's that they have certain beliefs about their condition or who they are or their potential for recovery that are incompatible. We would call them treatment incompatible or recovery incompatible beliefs. And so if I believe that I'm hopeless or somehow I'm different than everyone else, yes, that may be true. OCD is treatable, but not my OCD because I may have a certain kind that I have come to believe is untreatable or different. There's many ways that people can have different beliefs. If I believe that my condition is medical and how in the world could a psychological therapy help that, right. that would be an example of recovery avoidant belief, uh, recovery interfering beliefs, because it keeps me from trying things that might potentially benefit. I see that with, and it's one of the topics that I've kind of asterisked to zoom into deeper with things like POTS or sometimes with different panic disorder where the, the focus on the physiological cues is so intensified, but also different people with different chronic illnesses and hormonal changes that are going to impact anxiety and different things. And, and so part of the struggle is going, well, yeah, some of this is absolutely real. And I think that's important to validate for anybody, <laughs> like, you, you know, even if it's just anxiety, it's real. Right. But also yeah. separating what part could be benefited from this medical follow up, what part of this could be benefited from the mental health follow up. And we honestly, we see even more globally in different intersections, we see how these different cultural community beliefs can make such an impact. I live here in the Midwest now. And it's very much a Bible Belt area, which can bring a lot of strengths to folks, but also can bring different challenges, particularly around mental health. And I would say I've noticed a big improvement over the last, well, really, when I went to graduate school in the West Coast and they were like, hey, crazy, <laughs> going over here to the West Coast. Don't you know if you have a psychological problem that you should just repent and get yourself right with God? Example of a treatment interfering belief. Absolutely. Right. So that person may be more likely to utilize their faith traditions, which, by the way, I'm a big proponent of. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if they have a mental illness, that may or may not fully address it. And they're not incompatible. Right. And it is part of the reason why it's important, again, to have more of these conversations. And so what we're trying to do in good treatment, I, I would hope that people are mindful and not trying to change your overall, your value system, but seeing how two things can be true at once. And you can have your community belief, whether it's a faith belief, whether, you know, this comes up a lot in the BIPOC community for neurodivergent communities and understanding who you are and go, and if there's mental illness here, if there's a mental health disorder, that you don't have to live at this level of your world shrinking because it just feels like it can't ever be better than this. It can be better than this. And we can still value and respect this belief system that you're coming from. So it's really partly understanding, listening, recognizing, and even sometimes going, well, this interference, we can work together on this. Like, it doesn't have to clash with. But sometimes there are some really strongly held beliefs, not only by the person, but from a broader community perspective. And so we bump into this. And one of the things you talk about in the book and helping understand how this can grow, if we could just use Roy in that example that you've provided, you talk about how the family can get in this sort of trap, right? It's a bit of a parallel process. And so you talk about the family trap in the book. And if we were to kind of spell out an example of what a family trap might look like for Roy, <laughs> what might that look like for listeners? Well, I think to understand the trap, It'd be helpful for your listeners, if it's all right, for me to maybe at this point go over accommodation and minimizing, although I'm much more familiar with accommodation, so I won't belabor it too much. But sure. that understanding and lack of judgmental approach to the recovery of order, we want our families to apply those same things to themselves. 
And the, because often they are unfair to themselves, the same way they might be judgmental of the recovery avoider. And so we're all just operating, doing the best we can in a world that has multiple factors influencing our behavior. And so we need to be kind to ourselves. So there's mm -hmm. all the work of self-compassion that has come out recently is apropos here. Mm -hmm. Now, as we begin to do that, we also have to pair that with a clear recognition of the things we're doing that are counterproductive. And so there's a balance and we try to help people reading the book to be good to themselves, but also to not be afraid to look at how to change and what they're doing that actually isn't working and possibly making things worse. Mm -hmm. and that's how people end up in the family trap. So there are two natural responses to recovery avoidance and almost all families do it to some extent or another. They accommodate and they minimize, mm -hmm. but those things start very innocently as things like helping and persuading. So when we see someone struggle, we want to help them. So when your impaired relative is struggling, you try to step in and help them. When they are avoiding recovery, you can try to persuade them and persuade them to do better, to take things the challenges on. Both of those things are good. Don't stop doing that, people out there. Yeah. The problem is, when you're doing those things with a recovery avoider, it doesn't turn out so well. Mm -hmm. Helping devolves into accommodation and persuasion turns into minimizing. So what are those two things? Well, I think your, your audience probably knows what accommodating is sometimes in the substance use field called it enabling, but it's when you treat someone in a way that's different than you would treat other folks who otherwise have the same intelligence or the same age, but somehow you're modifying your behavior to either help them avoid challenges or to engage in certain kinds of compulsive or ritual behavior when you try to help them. Mm -hmm. All good intentions here, but it doesn't turn out well with a recovery warrior. Now, minimizing is a lesser known term because we coined the term and describe a lot of behaviors that in the family research literature is sometimes called expressed hostility or expressed criticism, but they're the results of frustration, uh, hopelessness that desperately trying to get the recovery warrior to change. Mm -hmm. And that includes, all right, trigger warning, we're gonna see some not pretty behaviors here. It's human to do this, lecture, prod, criticize, yell, bargain, try to bribe, whatever, all of these behaviors that are all attempt to get the recovery avoider to snap out and, right. and to change in some way. And the reason we call it minimizing is that you're trivializing the forces that drive the behavior. You're not fully recognizing how hard this is for that recovery avoider to do anything other than what they're doing. And so the idea that, that you're giving the implicit message that somehow you can snap out of this because of something I say or something I do, and the fact is they can't. And so what happens is instead of inspiring them to, or intimidating them to change, what happens is increasing their anxiety because they don't feel they're in a trusted environment. You guys don't get it. You don't understand. And that's right. more actually how hard this is. And so they feel more anxiety and more anger and dig in their heels even more, feeling more defensive. And more importantly, that, that they're in an environment in which they can't trust because people are not recognizing what they're going through or validating the way they see the world or whatever. So their anxiety goes up, which of course increases recovery avoidance. So the point here is this, these two main ways that families react to recovery avoidance mm -hmm. actually, first of all, don't work at best mm -hmm. and often make it worse. How? When you accommodate, and I think everybody knows this, you increase dependency and entitlement on the part of the recovery board. They become too expected. And what happens is you're, you're taking away the potential motivation or incentive for them to go get help or to pursue recovery because we don't go to the doctor to become a better person. 
Now you mentioned California and I, I, I'm going to use my usual joke that only in California do people actually go to the doctor to become a better person. But in the other 49 states, no, they only go to the doctor when they're in pain or when they are, are in, have something interfering with their ability to do things. And so when we take away, when we protect our loved ones, we buffer them from some of those consequences of their behavior that would actually drive them to pursue recovery and get help. We also take away opportunities. If you do my laundry for me and I'm 31 years old and you're doing my laundry for me, I can't learn to do laundry because you're doing it. Right. And now, trust me, I know the recovery voider is not begging for opportunities to learn to do laundry. Yeah, nor would I if I had someone doing my laundry every day. But that doesn't mean they don't need to have that experience. Now, to be clear, mm -hmm. there are just like there are really good reasons why people with, with these conditions have recovery avoidance, there are really good reasons why families engage in those behaviors, no matter how counterproductive they are. Mm -hmm. There are good, strong forces why they keep doing that. Now, when they accommodate, they are going to be burdened. And when we are burdened, we are more likely to minimize, mm -hmm. to net, to do all the kinds of negative behaviors that then create more defensiveness and anxiety and distrust in the recovery avoider, which then reinforces recovery avoidance. So if people get the book, there's a plug for the book, but you'll <laughs> see a diagram that will explain how all those things interact. And that is what we call the family trap. The more you accommodate, the more they depend on it, the worse their recovery avoidance gets. And the more you accommodate, the more you feel burdened, the more you minimize, the more they feel anxious and defensive. Mm -hmm. And they're more likely to avoid recovery in its a vicious cycle. And yeah. Family all stuck in this trap and they have no idea, most of them, how to get out. And I don't blame them because nobody taught us this. I didn't get a course in recovery avoidance in high school or college. Right. Yeah. That's sort of what we call the family trap. That's what minimizing and accommodating are. Well, and we are definitely going to do our due diligence in plugging the book, Family, because I think this will be really helpful for you. As always, if you go over to this episode's blog at ocdfamilypodcast.com, you can learn more about it. We'll just have even a link probably to Amazon if you just want to hop on over and check it out. But it is a super helpful book. And I do find those diagrams. I was telling you now, like before, you know, some of the books are so dense and they're amazing books. But a lot of times people are coming into these conversations already exhausted, feeling defeated, angry, upset, shame, all of the feelings. Name a feeling. I'm sure it could be plugged in there. And so having it simplified and something mapped out where you can go, OK, I see how this works. I'm seeing how it's applied. Now I can insert our specific family cycle going in here to see how it's following this trap and not just the trap, but solutions for how to get out of that trap. So definitely you're going to want to check out that book. One of the things I was thinking as you were talking to is I was like, you're giving Californians too much credit, dude. <laughs> if you know, you know, right, Californians? I'm not hating on my fellow Californians, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Your friends will be calling you tonight. My friends, my friends. And friends, it'll be great to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things you also talked about, and I've had conversations with people about this as well. And I think sometimes people can feel where they can shut down around this concept, where we talk about this practice, even though it's coming from a well-intentioned place of both accommodation and minimizing is kind of the natural effect of feeling like you're hitting your head against a wall, right? Can build this environment where there isn't that trust. And I find people get triggered by that comment, right? You know, because they're, they're like, what? Are you saying I'm unsafe? Like, I'm doing everything I can to help this person. And so I just wanted to revisit that concept a little bit because thank you again for everything you're doing for your loved one. Thank you. You're dedicating your life and your devotion to it. But also, that's kind of the point. You're dedicating your life and devotion to it, to this person's recovery or lack thereof. What about your life? What about the devotion to the things? And yes, your loved one matters, but you've stopped at some point prioritizing your needs and it's all focused here and it's creating that pressure 
you know, as you were talking about minimizing behaviors, I was like, you know, if I weren't cued in to OCD and I was just listening to this conversation and how you can't bargain, you can't you can't get somebody to choose this. It reminded me a lot of potty training, right? You can't force somebody that's learning how to listen to their bodily cues to go to the bathroom. And boy, haven't you tried if you've been a parent that's been through potty training. Now, thankfully, it's been quite a few years since I've been in potty training. But whether we're talking about eating food and what you eat and swallow and when you choose to go to the bathroom or void, you cannot force another person to do this. It has to be their choice. And so ultimately, when we're coming to this conversation of accommodation and minimization, like, honestly, it's not that different. We can't force this. And the more we try and the more in intensity and pressure that is felt by the person that needs to complete this task, the more there can be some resistance or refusal or more anxiety, which can cause more problems with being able to actually be successful. And so again, just to the point that you made, this isn't found specifically just in OCD. Like this is an issue that we can run into in a lot of different areas. And so when it's around mental health, one of the things that you can bump into, particularly in the adult population, you can find this in the adolescent and and unfortunately sometimes in the younger population is the desperation for your loved one to do something is so intense. And then their desperation to survive the rawness of what they're experiencing, it's not about avoidance as much as their fear and their their struggle, right? They can get to places like saying, hey, if you don't help me, I'm going to kill myself. If you oh, don't yeah. help me, I'm going to do this. And so when parents or family members or spouses are faced with choices where it's like, what else am I supposed to do? I hear things about not accommodating, but I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if they killed themselves. Right. And so this is a common struggle around I, I feel stuck. And we hear this in the substance use community, too. I feel stuck because I feel like the circumstance is so dire. It's one of those situations, though, where I'm like, yeah, these people are more like than different. They feel like the circumstances are so dire that we are to a life and death situation. But it is kind of a special circumstance that is, again, very manageable. And can we talk a little bit about how that concern, how you buffer that concern in terms of the recovery avoidance? Oh, yeah, that's a great, because uh, you've really touched on probably the number one reason why families stay stuck in the trap is their fear of when they try to make changes, they get a response from the recovery avoider that is scary. Mm -hmm. And then they pull back because of those very reasons that you were articulating. So it's not a coincidence then that in the five steps that we outline, prepare for crisis is step number one. Mm -hmm. There's no sense trying to do anything else till you have thought this out and really strategized about a different way to deal with crises. Mm -hmm. Because we very much tell folks in the book that expect a crisis. And if we told them that there wouldn't be, they, we'd probably lose all credibility because they know better. Because right. most of them tried already to try to make changes and they've had to deal with crises. So that's really important. There's a couple of things though, different ways of looking at crises that I would encourage your listeners to think about. Mm -hmm. But first, let me say, I totally get it why you don't want to take any risks. Yeah. This is, it's one thing like, oh, okay, he won't, he'll have to wear a dirty shirt if I start doing his laundry versus, oh, he could take his life or he could tear up the house. Right. Or he's one of us. Right. Uh, that's a very different consideration. Those are what we would call crises, obviously. Yeah. As opposed to everything else, which where the consequences are are much less severe. So this is a critical part. And it's why we have it as step number one. Yeah. So to think about this, though, one sort of misunderstanding that I think some families have, if, if we go through these changes, and we're just, just going to use suicide as one example, there are others, but mm -hmm. it, it, if we go through with this, that he might take his life. And okay, that's always a possibility. We would be foolish to tell you other ones. Right. But the illusion that we have to pop here is that if we don't make the changes, they won't try to kill themselves. Right. And, and so now you have to ask yourself, 
do I want to take the risk of my loved one harming themselves and keep doing the same thing and over and over again that I know dooms us all to a life of misery? Or if some terrible thing, unthinkable thing happens, if it's going to happen, might it happen out of trying to change and giving my loved one the greatest opportunity to change that I am capable of? And more importantly, or as importantly, that I'm taking care of myself and the rest of the family. Because so often the sole focus is on the recovery avoider and the mental health of the rest of the family mm -hmm. is ignored. Mm -hmm. So if we just take the risk of, oh, he might take his life and in isolation and artificially tie that only to us making changes for the better, then we're going to keep making decisions that are not healthy. We have to make it a little more nuanced, which is harder for most of us to do. Right. And it's, it's not just suicide potential if I make changes. It's also suicide potential if I don't make changes. And in the long run, I would tell you that you have a higher probability the person's going to harm themselves if you don't make changes in the long run mm -hmm. than if you do make changes. Mm -hmm. That's also the other part of this is how you handle the crisis. There are ways that you handle crises that actually reinforce maladaptive behavior or recovery avoidant behavior. And so what we try to teach in the book is our goal in a crisis is to get the family safe as quickly right. and swiftly as possible Safety with as first. accommodating and minimizing. Mm -hmm. And then we have to deal in that process. Families have to deal with their own belief systems that get in the way of them doing what's healthy. It's not just the recovery avoiders who have recovery interfering beliefs. And in fact, in chapter four, we go through some of those beliefs that families have that keeps them from really taking care of themselves and making the changes they need to make. But if I'm too concerned about what the neighbors are going to think, if I call an ambulance right. and I understand it, I'm, I'm, it's, there's no judgment here. I would be embarrassed too. But now we've got to say, what's, what's our priorities? What's our values? So what families often do, and I'm just giving one example, stay up all night and coach the person right. to convince them there's a reason to live or whatever, and put that burden on themselves instead of the system that's designed to deal with these kinds of emergencies. Now, what happens then? And this is, I'm just, this is a stereotype. Okay. But just to make the point, so now you've been up till three in the morning, everybody goes to bed. All right. They feel safe. Now, and the next morning you have to get up because you got to go to work. Now you haven't slept. And you're kind of resentful because you worked a lot harder last night than your loved one who has the crisis. Right. Uh, and then you say some things the next day, maybe, that aren't very nice mm -hmm. because you're resenting that. And on top of that, you've actually reinforced suicidal talk because you've stayed up all night surrounding, the, rather than swiftly getting the person to a safe environment so that the person learns. If I'm going to talk that way, we will take it seriously. Right. And we will take action. If you're just expressing your misery in those ways. Yeah. And you don't really literally mean you're going to take your life. Then you need to learn how to stop talking that way and talk about your misery in a different way. Because we're going to take it seriously. And we're not going to try to figure out whether you mean it or not. Well, and it goes back to that old adage of actions speak louder than words. So your intention of feeling like you're kind of talking somebody off a bridge kind of gives this thought process to both you and that other person that they're going to need you to talk them off the bridge. They couldn't make it through that without you. You're going to feel the importance of like, I can't do anything else because what if this person gets on that bridge again? And honestly, you don't have control over that. And so what we do learn with action speaking louder than words is if somebody brings up, and so anybody listening that's like, okay, so what am I supposed to do with that? Well, if somebody says I'm thinking or I'm planning or uh, I'm going to try and kill myself if you don't wash the shirt for me or whatever the situation is because they're panicking and they're having a hard time and you're panicking, then 
actions speak louder than words, right? Okay, then we're going to the hospital. And if you're not going to go to the hospital, maybe they're avoidant to go to the hospital, then I'm going to call 911 or I'm going to call my country's emergency code because this just got bigger than me. If me putting the boundary of I'm not going to do this for you or I'm going to take care of my own needs in this moment has this reaction, then that was bigger than me anyway. And we're going to get you to somebody that safely can evaluate and get you the help you need if you need it. Yeah. And I want to follow up on what you just said, which is very nice because I don't want people to misinterpret. I am not saying that you should never listen to people when they're in misery, mm -hmm. that you should never try to influence them in a positive way. What I am saying is that you need to learn quickly when it's not working. Mm -hmm. Because if a person's not in recovery avoidance and you stay up and help them feel but let's say they get up the next morning, they say, you know what, I, I really appreciate what you did for me last night. I was feeling it at the edge of what I could tolerate. And you kind of made me think about life being worth living. I think I've got to get some help because I don't want to put that burden on you. I need to get help from my condition. See, what I'm saying is that what we do as families is a good thing to do yeah. initially. But then when you see that it's having the opposite effect of what you wanted it to be, you've got to figure out that's not working. In fact, maybe I'm part of the problem here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And honestly, it, it puts an incredible and again, unrealistic ability on your shoulders, that burden of feeling like I can keep this person alive. And uh, you can't. Sometimes they're struggling to feel like they can even do that. So how could you, another person, have an even greater capability than them in terms of feeling like they can manage that? It's, it's one of those situations where it's like one of the biggest gifts anybody can give themselves is recognizing when they are out of their lane of ability. Because we just cannot perform beyond what we're capable of performing. We have no ability no magic wand and it really sets up a dangerous precedent if something at god forbid ever did happen to feel like wow that was on me it's because i went to work and i wasn't here to help that person it's a common enough misunderstanding but you're not god even the most amazing doctors that have these different life-saving techniques or understand these really complicated illnesses can't guarantee life they can only fight the fight with the tools that they have, and the same goes for us. Well, somebody a lot smarter than me came up with the serenity prayer, and there is a lot of wisdom in that prayer. And we, we highlight it in chapter three when we start to talk about, because I'm sure I promise to the families out there, we're going to talk about things you can do, not just what you can't do, but you do need first to know what not to do and why, and then in chapter three, we start to talk about a different way of approaching things. And we start with a serenity prayer because that beautiful three-line thing clarifies that you need to focus on things you can control and not on things you can't control and to have the wisdom to know the difference. And many of our families are stuck trying to control things they can't control. And at the same time, they're not doing the things that they need to do and that they actually have control over doing. Right. And that's really the, the, the key. The crux of it. Yeah. I, I know I keep bringing up this particular conversation, I have many conversations over the years, but again, because I find so many similarities with the substance use community. When I was talking with Dr. Patrick McGrath last year, I was saying it in a way, even this family community, the OCD family community is a bit of our own little Al-Anon type group, which for anybody unaware, Al-Anon is for a loved one supporting people that are struggling with different substance use disorders. And it's such an important thing to be able to focus on. Yeah, there, there are a lot of things we can't control, what we can control, how we love on our people and how we love on ourselves in some very practical ways. And a key piece of this and what we're going to talk about even in what we can do to help is having this communication up front. So if you know your person is prone to crises or maybe it surprises you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it went to that level. But usually, you know, people tuning in may have already experienced a, a bargaining of if you don't do this for me, I might hurt myself. 
And so what's really important is having that communication up front, too, and going, okay, the way we've been handling this, I don't think it's been helpful for anyone. And so we're going to think about, and that way it's not a surprise if we bump into this, how we're going to handle crises. So because your life is so important and this world is better with you in it, if it gets to a point where you question if you can continue to go on, we're going to get you to help immediately. Well, that touches on another important point that I, that I think we make in the book is the importance of communication, mm -hmm. which I know you've talked about as well. When we just taking step one, the crisis, and this is true for all of the steps, but whenever you're about to make a change in how you respond to the recovery avoider, we really encourage you to put it in writing to say, this is what we're going to be doing. This is when we're going to start doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is why. And the why is not about, obviously, I know people probably know this, but it's not about because you behave badly, meaning the recovery avoider. This is about, as you suggested as well, Nicole, this is about what's happening in the family and how painful it is for all of us. Mm -hmm. And this is not working for any of us because I can't keep doing your laundry for you. And that's our metaphor here. Yeah. Without feeling resentful because of the way you make me do it, be the way you tell me to do it is so exacting and so frustrating that I then feel resentful. And then I don't treat you well mm -hmm. because I'm resentful and I don't want to feel that way towards you. And I don't want to act that way towards you, but I don't have the ability as a human being to wish those feelings away and still do all the things the same way I've been doing them. I have to change my behavior for my own welfare mm -hmm. and I think ultimately yours. You may not like some of the changes that I'll make, but you're going to like a lot of the things that I'm going to do because I'm not going to be nagging you like I used to or doing the lecture number 301, whatever it is. that the So the whole thing is to frame this as we are stuck as a family in an interaction pattern that is harmful for all of us. And we're trying to change that. Right. And that's the way you present it. And you tell them ahead of time. You don't just start making the changes. Right. Yeah. It's a managing expectation thing. You know, often, even if we don't like the outcome, if we know the difference is coming, we can brace for it or absorb it in a different way. Think about this just even in basic relationships, family. So if we think about not even like a mental health crisis per se, but if I have an expectation that, you know, my husband's going to put the trash out on the curb the night before the trash collection. I just heard the trash truck, so this is like inspired it in real time. Then if he suddenly stops doing that and I don't want piles of trash loading up, then I either need to have a conversation with him or I need to go put the trash out on my own. But isn't my feeling going to be different if he never was like, hey, babe, so I'm going to change some of the ways we've been doing trash collection, right? Right. A simple thing can become this really big problem that can accumulate because we didn't have a conversation about it. We didn't manage expectations. You, you can see how that could cluster in that situation. So now we apply it to a situation where we have OCD in the family system or some other kind of complex mental health situation. Often OCD commingles and entangles itself with lots of other things. And so often it's just this accumulation of different problems and stressors. And if we don't give that communication up front, then people are going to be like, what the hell? What, where did this come from? It is going to be a shock to the system. Plus, communicating it ahead of time gives them a, a time to adapt to it, and it takes away the surprise element. And, you know, even talking about what can we control, and we can control some of these different changes. You know, Alec, I will run into this conversation with clients, but also we've talked about it here on the pod around... I think it just speaks even to that resentment that you were talking about earlier around, I shouldn't have to be the one to change. Like the problem is what's going on and what they're doing. And I've actually sacrificed a lot of myself, this whole family has, to come around this person. So sitting there going, well, you should change and, and focus on the things you should change can feel a bit abrasive, can feel frustrating, can feel Unfair. Uh, invalidating. Yeah, unfair. And so what would you say to that? 
Well, so if you want to make any therapist cringe, by the way, folks out there, <laughs> you talk to your therapist, use the word should. Um, yeah. uh, therapists hate that. I, I like to use it in front of them just to watch them cringe. Uh, sometimes they break out in a rash when you use that. <laughs> so if you use it, you will universally be corrected by the therapist almost always because should is a word that's often associated with unrealistic expectations about right. the world. So should refers to this, I shouldn't have to blah, 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 or I should have done this, refers to an imaginary world in which everyone knows better and everyone has unlimited capabilities and whatever. But it's not a very healthy word. You could say, I wish I could have done that, or sure. I would like to have done this. That doesn't imply that you're somehow doing something wrong. But should, yeah, okay. If you change it to, I wish I didn't have to be the one to change, that's healthy. Because, yeah, yeah you, you can wish you didn't have to be. You can wish that your loved one didn't have a serious mental illness. But it is what is true. It is the reality that you deal with, and it is reality that you have to deal with. Alec, the irony, too, is often you have actually changed for the situation. So the comment of I shouldn't have to change, well, actually, we actually stopped kind of doing the things we enjoyed as much, and we stopped kind of treating this person in the dynamic that we have previously. And we've started really focusing on OCD or whether it's substance use or depression or anxiety, whatever's popping up there. And so we've made changes. Maybe it's been subtle enough changes that we haven't recognized it. But part of what we're missing is what life used to be or what we thought it was going to be following the certain trajectory before we stopped crowding around OCD or crowding around this mental health issue that is causing so much impairment for our loved one and for our family. And so, yes, we need to stop shooting on ourselves. Another kind of fun tongue in cheek phrase out there. But also we are in agreement that you can go back and be the person that you are and were. You don't need to change for OCD. You don't need to change for this mental health issue, we can start having and making, creating choices where it's like, I am going to actually go out for date night and not stay here and feel like I'm going to be tethered to you so that you can make safe choices and get through the evening. Or I'm going to go to bed. And if you do escalate to a level, I'm going to follow through and make sure you get to the right medical care to manage the crisis. I'm going to actually reunite with the way I was acting previous to this mental illness getting so loud. If you change that phrase to really reflect, because that's the way somebody might think about it. But if we just change that phrase to, I shouldn't have to do something that's actually in my control, then it shines a light so much more obviously on the cognitive error that's underneath this. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you do something that's actually in your control instead of doing something that you trying to change something you cannot control? Yeah. And the question is, is it in your best interest to change? That's the question, not should you have to change? Right. Yeah. No, very, very well said. And so we've talked a lot about how how the family functioning can shift with accommodation, with minimization. We're talking about some of the refocus on what we do actually have control for. And there's a lot more to this in the book. Again, I'm going to refer you over to the blog so you can link and jump over and, and get your copy of this book. But just as we end our time together, which I've so appreciated your time, what kind of message of hope and what would you offer to listeners sitting there feeling discouraged, but really wanting to help promote health and wellness for themselves, for their loved one? What kind of takeaway would you recommend for them in just kind of walking away from this conversation and how they can move forward? Well, the most encouraging thing I could say is that the vast majority of families that we worked with have been able to improve their lives substantially and even that of the person with the mental illness. But So then I'm going to say something that might be a little discouraging, and then I'm going to say something that's going to be encouraging. So, Fair. But, so the discouraging part is that you, you really are going to have to step back and reassess, and, and that's really our step two, is really 
redefine the problem. You've got to start seeing this as a family crisis. Right. You, and start looking at those things, how you're affected by this. And then eventually we want to try to help you change that so that your own well-being, your own mental health is taken care of. And believe it or not, you know, despite what the protests are, the recovery avoider, those almost always end up being better for the recovery avoider. So when I was saying discouraging, it's sort of, okay, you're not going to make that person in your family all of a sudden want to do the right thing in your mind, at least. But you can greatly improve the quality of your life and also indirectly affect the person with recovery avoidance. Now, for some people who are recovery avoiders, the idea in the near future of going to treatment is probably too ambitious an idea. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. Some of them will eventually go to treatment. But what we've noticed is that even if they still resist treatment, they are learning new behaviors and moving, shifting towards recovery seeking as opposed to recovery avoidance. And little small ways, doing chores that they didn't used to do around the house, mm -hmm. maybe starting to take a class, maybe doing things, getting out more. And many families have said, oh, they come to the dinner table more often now. Mm -hmm. We didn't see them for months at the dinner table. Why are they coming to the dinner table? Because they're starting to trust more. They're starting to the family environment is one that facilitates recovery as opposed to makes it aversive. And so the other thing I would say is, first, the discouraging part, it's going to take a while. Now, the encouraging part, once you accept that this is going to take a while, for example, stop comparing your loved one to other people, his or her age, and how far behind they are. And that's completely unhelpful. They have a disability. You can't compare them with people. By the way, I drive much better than a person who's blind. <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. Yeah. No, it's, okay, I don't, I'm not blind. I can drive. They have more difficulty doing that. So right. you have to have a whole different timeline you have for this loved one. And usually it means being less ambitious. I'm not saying giving up, but to still have hopes and goals but you need to make them more realistic right. and fair to the recovery border and fair to you. So that's what we try to get across in the book, to slow down, to really take your time, to redefine the problem, start to build a family environment that promotes recovery as opposed to promotes recovery avoidance. I love that. Yeah, because I think so often it's, you know, realistic goal setting, like we want to attack the whole animal. Right. You know, and it's like you can't you got to take a bite. Sometimes you got to just turn on the oven. It's like, you know, sometimes it's these little steps. Wait, wait. Uh, don't forget to turn the oven off, though. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be checking the oven a lot. <laughs> the uh, community here is like touche. Alec with checking the oven. <laughs> touche. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate having this conversation. And again, family, his new book, When a Loved One Won't Seek Mental Health Treatment, is out and available on Amazon, probably amongst different bookstore providers. But we so appreciate you just having the conversation with us for the dedication and work that you've continued to put into the field. And I think if I walk away with one note here, and it's one that we, family, it comes up quite a bit is to work on having that open stance. It's that openness and setting those realistic expectations. One thing I will say, it's just kind of a nerdy geometry thing, but even if we took an old compass and a protractor, I say this clients all the time, so anybody listening, they're going to be like, yep, she does. But when we think change needs to happen, often people are like, 180 degree, we need this to change. But if you actually have even one degree of change and you follow that array out, it might not look like much right now, but follow it over time and it's forever on a different course. That's the power of one degree of change. And so just even opening that stance, having more family dinners, enjoying times where we can joke or watch TikToks or whatever people do these days, you know, to connect. When's the last time we laughed together? These changes send us on a different trajectory. So 
Thank you for being such a big part of that. And, you know, anytime, if you would ever want to come back and chit chat with the band, I'm sure the band would be happy to have you. I know I would as well. So thank you so much, Alec. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back anytime you want, Nicole. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. Man, that that was a really important conversation. He really is a treasure in our field. And the incredible calm he's able to speak into our storms not only brings hope, but practical, amazing tips as well. So first things first, we have all the links to learn more about Alec, the Center for OCD and Anxiety Related Disorders at St. Louis Behavioral Institute. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And ding, 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 the link to where you can grab a copy of his latest book, When a Loved One Won't Seek Mental Health Treatment. It's all going to be listed over on this episode's blog at ocdfamilypodcast.com. So definitely check that out. And that brings us to our intrusive thought segment, which for any new fam joining us is my application segment of the show. Because all this chatter is great, right fam? But how can it help us today? So I take the time every show where we can figure out just that. Because we don't have to figure this all out on our own. We're family and we're better together. So for today's intrusive thought segment, I wanted to circle back to what Alec was sharing about the serenity prayer. And again, for those less familiar, the statement has long been included in many 12-step programs for addiction recovery, but it's also become a common enough phrase to show up on home goods and housewares and hanging out with a live, laugh, lob plaques, you know? But though a simple statement, it's an important reminder. And it reads, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Family, there are a lot of things we cannot change. There are also a lot of things we can. And it might feel completely scary and unnerving to even consider scaling back on an accommodation or embracing the chaos, but the reality is we are strong. Our warriors, they're strong. And if these things will move us toward a healthier, more functional life together, whether it's not avoiding the laundry or changing out of our clothes first thing when we get home or not driving our partner around when it makes us resentful and they're capable of driving and just too scared or maybe just going out for that movie with friends because it's going to fill my cup. Give me a break. Provide some respite. Because family, we're in a situation where we don't have to just survive alive. We can really live. We can reclaim joys we've lost, stop doing things we wouldn't do if our loved one wasn't battling OCD or any of these other debilitating challenges. So I'm going to challenge us all to list at least one thing, one, just one, and choose to accept that we have no control over it. We cannot change that. And then I'm going to challenge you on the flip side to determine one thing that you can change that is within your control. So for me, I'm thinking of a loved one that has OCD and has really gotten stuck and tortured. And you know, I mean, I treat OCD, so I should be able to help, right? But they've also had some really difficult experiences with treatment that haven't been helpful. So they're not exactly jumping for another opportunity to dive back in. I can't control that for them. I can't convince them. But I can choose not to engage in the rumination spirals with them that ultimately leave them feeling frustrated or invalidated or can tax or trigger me, but I can't choose to acknowledge they are working so hard and I love them, period. I don't have to engage in the spirals and I can still love them. I can control showing them compassion without getting absorbed into a 45 minute conversation every day that takes time away from me tending to my own needs. And they can ultimately hear less of what can easily turn into minimization. So I challenge you to find those changes, fam. And if your change is going to affect the loved ones around you, remember Alex's really helpful tip of writing it down and communicating that change. Magnet it to the fridge. Dry eraser marker on the mirror. Because knowing what to expect, having that heads up, and time to adapt makes such a huge difference. So let's give it a try this week, fam. Because remember, even one degree of change can forever set us on a different track. And while we can't control other people's choices, can we, for ourselves, shift one degree? You bet we can. And you know what? We are worth it. Our warriors are worth it. So let's do this. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed 
enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit ocdfamilypodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the download on the family chatter. Oh yeah, nothing says family like Alec and me discussing our family trees. That's right, I went there. And you can too at ocdfamilypodcast.com.